Okay, welcome everyone to this webinar on Introduction to Qualitative Methods. My name is Simmer and um, I will be facilitating today's webinar uh, with help from Novia and Natasha. Uh, today's session is a result of collaboration between uh, students in student and research groups, including ECGG, SWIGS, and V2V Global Partnership. Uh, we will be starting with a presentation on an overview of qualitative research methods, followed by a panel discussion um, and hands-on activity. Um, we will end the session with a question and answer segment. Uh, before I introduce today's panelists, I would like to request the participants to keep their microphones muted during the presentation and panel discussions, which I see um, all of you are already doing, which is great. Um, you are welcome to use the chat option during the panel discussion to submit your questions to be taken up at the end of the session. Uh, for today's uh, discussion, we have a global panel representing various disciplines and backgrounds. And now I would like to introduce the panelists. Um, we have Amita Lazurko, who's completing a PhD in Social and Ecological Sustainability at the University of Waterloo. Anita will be drawing from qualitative methods used during her master's thesis and also um, some methods she's researched for her PhD. These include uh, document analysis, semi-structured interviews, guided questionnaire, workshops, uh, and various qualitative scenario methods. Um, and then we have Anna Carolina. Anna is a postdoc fellow with the V2V Global Partnership. Anna Carolina's research emphasizes participatory and transdisciplinary approaches to coastal governance, focusing particularly on social well-being, ecosystem services, marine protected areas, governance fit, um, and science policy interface. And I will discuss qualitative methods such as inter interviews, focus groups, and photo voice. Um, and then we have Jenya Mukherjee, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. Jenya will discuss the overlapping research frameworks, such as exploration of environmental history and political ecology in pursuing environmental social science research. Um, and Jenya will be using examples from her own research on Kolkata's blue infrastructures to develop to discuss qualitative research methods. Um, and last but not least, we have uh, Karina Figueroa, who is a PhD candidate at uh, University of Waterloo, pursuing a PhD in um, a degree, or sorry, pursuing a degree in systems design engineering. Karina um, uses various qualitative methods in her project, which aims to understand how meaningful decisions in interactive narrative games affect the player experience and games mechanics behind these choices. Um, so those are today's four panelists to discuss qualitative research methods. Um, now I would like to introduce uh, Prathip Nayak, who will be providing us with a, a general overview of qualitative research. Uh, Prathip is the project director for the V2V Global Partnership and is based in um, the School of Environment, Enterprise and Development at the University of Waterloo. Um, Prathip, please go ahead with um, the overview. Thank you, Simmer, and thank you uh, to all of you uh, who came together to organize this. You know, can you hear me properly? Okay. Um, uh, organize this, uh, you know, uh, event, you know, uh, which is something that is very dear to our heart, you know, because we, in our daily lives, we do uh, more qualitative uh, stuff than quantitative, but that doesn't mean that we don't value uh, quantitative, you know. Uh, a lot of uh, us are now getting involved in quantitative and qualitative mix, so mixed methods. Um, but there is always this, uh, you know, discussion around, uh, you know, quantitative, qualitative, and how to balance between this, uh, you know, these two uh, seemingly different, but apparently, uh, you know, interacting and complementary uh, kind of, you know, approaches, uh, especially because we you know, live in a very complex kind of, you know, world. So I think you know, I have uh, 10 to 15 minutes to speak. Uh, okay, you know, I'll try to finish uh, before that. So my purpose today is to uh, broadly reflect on, uh, you know, the significance of qualitative research, but in relation to quantitative research, you know, and I'm not an quant a quantitative uh, researcher. Uh, throughout my, uh, you know, uh, career, I have focused on uh, qualitative research, but I work with a lot of uh, people, scholars that engage in quantitative research. So I have a fairly good understanding of what quantitative research is, and I have a lot of respect for quantitative research, you know, from that perspective. To start with, you know, uh, 
you know, of course, there are different worldviews, there are different perspectives that we bring in, uh, not only as human beings, not only as individuals uh, and scholars, uh, but also as, you know, kind of, you know, individual researchers uh, to what we do in terms of research. Uh, these worldviews kind of, you know, influence and shape what we want to do in terms of our methods. The first distinction I would like to make in terms of, you know, talking about quantitative or qualitative or any kind of research is this very, uh, you know, uh, core meaning of methodology and methods. You know, I know you, you know, you already know the difference between this, but a lot of uh, people always kind of, you know, use methods and methodology uh, in an interchangeable uh, way and which is not correct. Uh, and when you talk about different kinds of methods or, you know, for say quantitative or qualitative, it is significant. Uh, your, it is significant to understand, uh, you know, the difference between methods and, uh, and methodology. Uh, you know, if you are in a, you know, in-person meeting, you know, we will have engaged in, you know, asking, uh, you know, and learning about, you know, what methodology and method, methods mean. But here, here is the, you know, core difference. When we talk about methodology, you know, methodology is uh, something uh, that comes as a research approach. Methodology is something that is the core belief, the core philosophy that we bring to the research. You know, it is not methods. You know, methods is more hands-on. Methods is more, you know, uh, on the ground, you know, tools, mechanisms, and instruments that you use, that you, you use to, you know, collect data. So it is something that you, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, bring in uh, to look at what kind of data you collect. But methodology is this uh, phase where you are, you know, if I may say, you are dreaming about your research and you're saying, what is good or bad for my research? What is, you know, uh, going to give me a solid foundation to launch my research, you know, a solid foundation to tell the world that this is what the core belief in my research is, you know. Uh, so, so, so that then sets you up on a great foundation to move forward towards research. So you bring in your feelings, you bring in your, uh, you know, overall uh, uh, belief system, values and philosophy, ideology, you, I, if I may say, all of these things to define what your research is. You know, so, so it is not about, you know, specific things about how you're going to do the interview, how you're going to, you know, collect data, what kind of data you want, you know. It is much more about how you research, when you have finished it, going to make a dent on the world, a positive dent on the world, okay? How it is going to contribute and what is the core philosophy? Is it going to destroy the humanity? Is it going to, you know, uh, you know create new ways of, you know, bringing innovation to the to, to humanity, you know, you can go in either way, you know, you can go multiple ways. So in what way you want to drive your research is something that comes from a methodological orientation. And then of course methods is, you know, so all of the things that you always do, you know, you, you know, you can do, you know, surveys, you can do, you know, interviews, you can do modeling, you can do frameworks and you can do multiple things. And those are things that you can see perceive, you know, these are uh, something that you can, you know, experience in a way that you can use it, okay? Uh, and these methods are always something that are related to the methodology because the philosophy guides your method, you know? So whether you want to do a survey, which is 300, uh, you know, people being surveyed uh, on one particular research question, or you want to sit with each individual, which is a res respondent, and learn about their life histories is completely different method, you know, but they can be subscribing to completely different methodologies, you know. So if you are ready to sit with, you know, 50 individuals individually with each one of them to learn about them in depth, it's a completely different methodology, you know, you know, and uh, compared to if you do a survey of 300 households. Okay? So methodology is important, methods are important. And why I talk about this uh, no, distinction is that, you know, when you talk about quantitative or qualitative, they are linked to this both, you know. So first methodology, you know, if you talk about what is qualitative research or for that matter, quantitative research, you know, these are part of a methodology because 
with the moment you say my research is going to be qualitative, you are bringing a completely different kind of worldview, philosophy, ideology, and you know, way of looking at things, the value systems, you know, everything. Then when you say I am going to do quantitative research, you know, because the interpretative value in both these methodologies or quantitative or qualitative can be very different, you know. So, for example, you know, so if you're talking to people in a quantitative, uh, qualitative approach, uh, or you're listening to life histories of somebody or the respondent in this particular case, then, uh, you know, uh, uh, then, then you are learning uh, about the problem in a much different way than if you are doing quantitative. Because in quantitative research, there is a possibility that the researcher himself or herself is the interpreter also. Because you look at the data, you look at the trends, you interpret things, you come up with a solution most of the time, not always. But in quant qualitative research, the interpretation is not something that is done by the researcher. The interpretation is something or the meaning of something is given to us or the researcher by the respondent themselves. Okay, so there are there are you know key differences between these two approaches, uh, and they are related to the methodology and methods. So uh, you know how do we look at qualitative research or quantitative research? Again, is it you know it they can be a way or a strategy for understanding phenomenon. Uh, you know, so for example, in a qualitative methods can be a set of strategies that you use to understand a phenomena that otherwise cannot be understood quantitatively, okay? So what cannot be done quantitatively, you try to do qualitatively. That's one way to understand this and vice versa. What cannot be understood quantitatively then should be attempted to be done qualitatively. So you can see that, you know, uh, these two are in a way needs to be related, needs to be linked, needs to be playing a complementary role. So what cannot be done qualitatively needs to be done quantitatively. Uh, and vice versa. So that's one way to understand it. So uh, then, you know, qualitative research is something that helps us to understand multiple ways of understanding, multiple ways of, you know, interpreting things, which is different from quantitative. It's not a binary, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's competitive, you know, in a way. So, uh, so if that is so, why we need to do quali uh, qualitative research? You know, again, you know, when I talk about qualitative research uh, in the next five or seven minutes, I'm not, you know, demeaning quantitative research. I'm not saying quantitative research is not meaningful. I'm just saying qualitative research is important. And in many places, in many contexts, it is important because it can complement quantitative research. Okay, that's where we, are, a lot of us are doing mixed methods approach. I'll give you five reasons, uh, you know, from my own perspective of why uh, a person like me would be interested in doing qualitative research, you know, with due respect to quantitative research. The first is, doesn't matter whether you are in natural science or you are in, uh, you know, uh, social science or you are in, uh, you know, health science or uh, other kinds of sciences, we are all trying to deal with complexity through our research. You know, complexity is a core element, is a, is, a, is, is something that is uh, uh, a common element to all the kinds of research we are engaged in. So complexity is unavoidable. And of course, I'm not going to go into the complexity theory. I'm not going to say what are the key attributes, but we know complexity is something that always exposes itself before us where we might see that one plus one is not always two. It might you know, expose us something else. And if a problem exposes itself like, uh, you know, it's not one, for, uh, one, one plus one being uh, two, which is a, you know, dominant theory, you know, dominant way of understanding numbers, then we are really faced with complexity. How do you deal with it? You know, so that's where, you know, we always say, you know, you bring in both ways of understanding. Okay, you know, if you see that one plus one is not resulting in a two in a complex world uh, within the context of your research, then you try to bring in other kinds of understanding. And that's where qualitative research comes in because qualitative research then would allow you to deal with the same complex phenomenon in multiple ways. You know, you might simply ask, in, you know, 
you know, your research question in a different way to find out what are the other perspectives of one plus one not being two in all contexts and all circumstances. Okay, so complexity complexity is a key driving uh, you know uh, force for engaging in multiple uh, you know research methods and qualitative research is something that we uh, you know look at when faced with complexity uh, because the challenges uh, you know nature of challenges uh, change. The second aspect of engaging in qualitative uh, research or you know, even you know, mixed uh, methods research is uh, looking at cross-disciplinary work. You know. So in our research, we are more and more uh, engaging and uh, uh, moving towards uh, combining different disciplines. Okay? Um, of course, there's a lot of disciplinary work that is taking place, uh, but at the same time, um, we have a bent of mind, we have a curiosity towards uh, cross-disciplinary work. You know, people might say interdisciplinary, you know, multidisciplinary, and we are working on transdisciplinary work within B2B uh, at this point in time. Uh, these are different ways of understanding how disciplines can combine uh, forces to you know, contribute to the you know, understanding and responding to the problems of the world. So if you are a believer in interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, you know, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary work, there is no way you can, you know, be engaging in one way of doing research, you know, say it for qualitative or quantitative, you know. So if you believe in, or if your research has one ounce of, you know, uh, cross-disciplinarity in it, then you are automatically uh, stepping into, uh, you know, uh, you know, both qualitative and quantitative. We just can't say, you know, I'm doing one. Uh, even if you uh, say that, then you are uh, putting your research in jeopardy because you are not going to have a complete understanding of the problem and complete, uh, you, know, you know, whatever you find uh, results are, are not going to be, uh, not going to be in a holistic in a way. So cross-disciplinary or transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary uh, T, interdisciplinary T uh, is uh, something that then uh, brings us into this multiple domains of research methods, you know, and that's where, you know, qualitative research comes in. The third is, uh, you know, something that, uh, again, uh, a lot of us are doing, you know, um, and it is related to the previous two elements that I mentioned, complexity and, uh, and, and, and cross-disciplinarity. A lot of our work is both oriented towards uh, society and nature. Okay, um, we, we want to understand a problem, uh, a complex problem, um, both with, you know, uh, you, know, an, uh, you, know, you know, interest in how it is situated within the social context, but also how it is situated within the, you know, natural context. So it doesn't matter whether we're a natural scientist or a social scientist. Our work is more human environmental, our work is more uh, you know, social ecological in nature. So uh, not only in terms of understanding the problem because most problems that are complex are also linked to the society and nature because they are social ecological in nature, okay? But at the same time, what you try to get out of your research, the results, the findings, and then the contributions that you want to make through your research has to contribute or has to be relevant for both society and nature, both to the environment and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, the humans. If that is so, then it is very hard to understand how you cannot or one cannot, um, you know, uh, employ or use uh, qualitative or, and quantitative research. Because the moment you step into the human domain, uh, you know, it is very absurd to me that you would be using quantitative analysis as the sole analytical method uh, to understand human behavior or human perceptions or human interpretations. So the moment you step into hu the human domain or the social, social domain, uh, you know, quantitative approach or quantitative research or methods becomes very limited because you cannot understand, you know, what's going on, uh, you know, inside uh, the behavioral and you know, domain of a person uh, or the you know complex realities of a society. What do you do in that? You, you know, uh, one way you know there are multiple ways. Of course, one way is to you know use qualitative research uh, methods to understand uh, what 
otherwise cannot be understood through quantitative research in uh, in, a, in a societal you know um, you know context. Um, so what do we do? You know, we do observations. You know, okay. You know, so you can observe a lot of things by being present in the context itself. You know, so. Um, but we also talk to people, you know, so uh, as social scientists, you know, uh, talking to people, uh, of course, within a, within a research, uh, you know, uh, uh, within research parameters, you know, talking to people involves specific methods. And those are qualitative methods. You know, you talk to people through interviews. You can do interviews, which are, you know, semi-structured, interviews that are structured, you know, direct interviews, indirect interviews, you know, uh, multiple types of talking, you know, ways of talking to people can be done through, you know, multiple ways of doing interviews. Uh, you know, uh, we do, you know, uh, you know, certain methods which are talking to groups, which we call them focus group, you know, uh, methods. So there are multiple ways to talk to humans. Uh, you know. But the core here is that the moment you are interested in what the humans are feeling, or what the human respondents are feeling, you need to talk to them and you need to talk to them in a more qualitative way than in a more qualitative, uh, quantitative way, because quantitative way can be very restrictive, uh, very, um, you know, uh, straightforward, unidirectional, uh, and uh, much more. Okay, uh, so qualitative research is then something that automatically kicks in the moment you talk about your, you know, your research being related to social ecological systems or human environment systems. Two more elements. One is, of course, you know, uh, things are not simple. We have talked about it. You know, I said, you know, complexity is the core driving force, you know, uh, for uh, why one would uh, like to in engage in qualitative research or for that matter, you know, mixing different kinds of, you know, research methods. When we are engaged in research, uh, depending on what uh, is our research question, uh, we are faced with multiple dynamics. And in human research, in, uh, you know, social science research, we always talk about, uh, you know, uh, power dynamics, uh, how politics happens, how uh, certain uh, problems, if not resolved, if not addressed or responded to in time, might lead to injustice, inequity, and uh, you know multiple ways of you know human suppression. Uh, you know as time progresses, so we address that. You know, and to address that, we use qualitative research because we think, you know, dynamics, human, you know, dynamics, uh, which are inherently linked to power and politics and, you know, uh, questions around, you know, who is more powerful, who is controlling, you know, who is, you know, grabbing all the opportunities and who, at what, whose cost. These are questions that are, to our mind, as social scientists, cannot fully ca be captured uh, through a quantitative approach. So we say, you know, let's engage in, uh, you know, qualitative, uh, you know, methods whereby we can understand these dynamics, um, you know, minutely, understand this uh, uh, and, and its very fine uh, ingredients. Uh, therefore, we can uh, bring out uh, solutions or responses. Um, I would just like to say you have a minute. Just okay, to... I'll finish in a minute, sorry. <laughs> Um, and then the last one is, of course, something that a lot of us do in social science, but, you know, natural scientists are also uh, engaging in it. So the difference between management and governance, you know, so whether you want to, uh, you know, uh, want your research to contribute to, you know, managing stuff or governing the stuff, you know, so uh, that difference then uh, brings in the question of qualitative and quantitative because governing is more principle oriented, governing is more in institution oriented, you know, it is more interaction oriented and it is more value system oriented, okay. So the moment you say, you know, I want to, you know, make long-term contributions to, uh, you know, um, to, 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 to the governance of the problem, uh, then you are uh, looking at, you know, qualitative. Um, I'll end with, you know, a quote from Einstein. You know, Einstein once said, you know, not everything that can be counted counts uh, and not everything that counts can be counted. You know, I'll leave it to you to, you know, uh, read it, uh, you know, a couple of times and listen to a couple of times. You will get some directions to engage in multiple uh, research methods, especially qualitative research methods. Thank you. Thank you, Pradeep, for, um, for providing us with an overview of qualitative methods and for the quote as well. Um, 
For this next section of this webinar, we would like, we would be moving to the panel discussion, which will have three rounds. Each panelist will um, have two to three minutes um, to respond to a guiding question related to understanding and executing qualitative research methods. Um, we will go in the order of Anita, Anna, Jenya, and Karina. Um, I'll quickly go over the three questions so you can frame your answers accordingly. So the first question is, uh, we're asking each panelist to give us an overview of qualitative methods that you've used and for what purpose. Uh, the second is focused on um, in what other areas have this method been used and for what purpose. And the last guiding question is, um, what resources and access requirements do you need to pursue this method and where to find them? Um, again, so the first question, we'll start off the round, is um, pr please provide us with an overview of the qualitative methods you have used and for what purpose, and that is for what type of information or what type of information it provides. Um, so if um, Anita can go first, uh, you have three minutes. I will give you a 30 second heads up to wrap up your point. Sounds good. Thanks so much. Um, hi, everyone. So yeah, my name is Anita. Um, and I'm actually going to focus my response today on the use of scenarios um, as kind of a, can be qualitative, can be quantitative, but as a kind of in-between method that draws from perhaps other methods that folks will discuss related to workshops or focus groups and whatnot. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'll just give you a brief introduction and, and speak a bit on it, but look forward to talking more about it later um, if there's time. So. Scenarios very broadly um, can essentially be defined as descriptions of possible futures and they can reflect different disciplines, different perspectives on the past, the present and the future. So like very, very broad. Um, and scenarios applied to any system um, can be in different types. So there can be predictive scenarios when we're pretty certain um, of the trajectory of of some sort of variable. This is often used in like economics where we, we're saying this will happen. Um, they can be more normative where we are trying to project um, futures that we want to happen. Um, and they can also be explorative where we're, we're essentially projecting what could happen based on our understanding of, of the, the past, present and what's possible um, in the future. And so in the past, in, in actually more consulting work, looking at strategic planning in river basins, I've used um, explorative qualitative scenarios. So these are scenarios where we're looking at what could happen um, as a tool for us to be able to kind of test our policies that we're, we're setting, you know, in the near future to see whether they'll be robust or, or effective in the long term. Um, but in the context of research, um, these explorative qualitative scenarios can be used um, in a number of ways, um, including to contribute to social learning in the context for folks who help um, develop them, to kind of evaluate any sort of qualitative method to kind of bring the future into a qualitative study um, very generally, um, and also to kind of feed more of the qualitative uh, knowledge that exists in a context into quantitative methods. Um, and I'm speaking very broadly, um, there are like a ton of different scenario methods. Um, one of the ones you may be more familiar with is intuitive logics, it's called. It's essentially where you have um, two critical uncertainties, each with like an extreme end state. Um, and you kind of often put them on a, a, an axis like um, with the end states on each end and then four different scenarios um, based on combinations of those end states. And so, um, yeah, I'm getting into details here, but what I mostly wanted to talk about is that uh, these qualitative scenarios have been used in uh, integrated assessment models to, to run a story and simulation approach where you work with stakeholders to develop, to develop storylines and narratives around um, uh, the context and then you work with engineers and modelers to bring those storylines and run those scenarios within your integrated assessment models. Um, and so these are like really neat ways to link qualitative and quantitative scenarios. Um, I might stop there. I hope I responded broadly enough to your question. Um, yeah, uh, I'll stop there and look forward to, to talking about it more. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Anita. Um, Anna? 
Hi. <laughs> so I'll focus on photo voice uh, for this presentation. So photo voice is a qualitative method that aims to tell a story through photographs. So as Pratip was saying, that qualitative methods is um, a good approach to go more in depth in human behavior, human perceptions, interpretation of the world. So this is uh, a way to do that, that people will take a photograph themselves from a subject or a question related to your research. So you might ask them what you are interested on. They will go take a photo of the, that and they will tell a story of the photo that represents what is represented in the picture that is based on their own perceptions of the world somehow. And um, this method, it's um, very interesting to grab values that people may have, values towards a specific situation or identity or related to nature. And this is also a really interesting engagement tool where the people that are participating in the photo voice from the beginning, they will be engaged in be thinking about the subject, they will go and search for the photographs or take photographs themselves. And all this process is a process that they are thinking about uh, the question that you gave to them and also get a kind of uh, participating more. And this is also a process that you can work on building trust with participants. And I did um, photo voice activity when I was uh, doing my field work. I was um, in a fishing community that was in the Southeast coast of Brazil where fishers were telling or community members are telling their experience and their connections to coastal ecosystems and this is an area that um, protected the areas are in place and sometimes they and they account mostly for economic aspects uh, of fishing and the restrictions and not much uh, the diversity of social well-being so uh, people were sending me pictures of the landscape when they go out fishing and they would say that this is uh, mental hygiene or this is a way that they go and they forget about the problems or so they are connecting the activity of fishing to mental health issues. That is also a point that is not included uh, much in um, protected areas management and governance that might be interesting to incorporate. They are also mentioning uh, about knowledge, local knowledge. So there was um, Another photo, I can also share that if we have uh, time later, um, of a fisher that he was teaching local biology students about coastal and environmental um, cycles or fish species. So uh, the lady that sent me this photo was saying that it's interesting to see how people that study in the university sometimes go to their community to understand more about the environment. So this is a great exchange of knowledge that uh, they are mentioning. Lots about their culture, their diet that are also very important to them, having fr fresh fish, specific things that they don't find in the market, but they can fish themselves. Uh, this uh, dimension of um, how people interact with others and with family members within the activity of fish and how that fishing and how that also relates to political arena. So while people are fishing, they're discussing about negotiations that they need to do with protected areas with the government to support their own traditions and livelihoods. Um, thanks, Anna. Uh, Jania, Thank you. I believe you have uh, slides you would like to share? Yes. <clears throat> Yes, uh, so oh, first of all, like, uh, thanks, Vidu, and thanks, Simar, and Pratip, sir, of course, that, you know, the, the questions are quite provocative, and, uh, you know, uh, can you see my slide? Yes. yes. So, you know, the first question, uh, when I saw the first question, they can you give us an overview of the quality methods you've used and for what purpose? So first, I, uh, you know, decided to discuss the purpose, and it's very, very empirical. So it is just, you know, uh, like 12,500 hectares of uh, land waterscape in the form of wetlands, which is uh, in the north of the Indian Sundarbans Delta. And this is uh, at the backyard of the city of Kolkata. And this is very, very important because it like recycles 750 million liters of waste for a city which really does not have a separate sewage treatment plan and generates, you know, um, uh, livelihood provisions for one lakh people. And, uh, and the reason why Kolkata is so affordable, so cheap, um, compared to other metropolitan cities is also due to the fact that, you know, East Kolkata wetlands exist here. 
Now, what is important is that, you know, if you uh, see the literature on these wetlands, you will find that there is an emerging literature now which uh, raises this question that how safe is it to consume fish varieties, you know, produced in East Kolkata wetlands. So, and these, uh, these scientists, they mainly, uh, you know, they try to, um, uh, they try to pertain to the WHO standards, unfortunately. And then there is another literature, mainly uh, literature produced by environmental sociologists and also uh, development uh, practitioners and development uh, studies experts who say that, you know, this, re uh, this wetlands, like several other, you know, ecosystem resources on the backyard of these uh, metropolitan cities had actually made way to real estate. So there is a real speculation which is uh, going on in this particular patch. So immediately what you find is that there is a, a kind of a, uh, you know, um, a, a binary evolves between uh, state and state-induced uh, development projects, development initiative where state aligns with the uh, transnational funding agencies and kind of promotes, you know, this uh, speculation spree. And on the other hand, there are the locals who are badly impacted by the conversion of the wetlands, and so the wetlands are mainly projected as you know locally owned, locally managed, locally preserved uh, wetlands, and there is a continuous tussle between the state and locals on the other hand. So uh, uh, I would quickly like to say, you know, um, I did not start with dislodging myths and dismantling binaries by philosophizing things, but rather, you know, the the scholarship appeared to be, you know, to an extent, to a great extent, actually linear and reductionist to me, because as Pratip mentioned, that it was important to actually unfurl, you know, complexities. So I wanted to understand um, this uh, wetlands as a very complex, you know, ecosystem. So one particular framework which I found very fascinating was by an urban architect called Stephanie Kalisle, and she uh, described these wetlands as living systems infrastructure. And, you know, I think it has a whole lot of, I mean, it can be replicable. It's, it has replicability uh, because, like um, she says, if you go through this uh, blog, uh, you will find out that she says that why, you know, resilient and adaptive infrastructures should be understood as not systems which are built, but they grow very slowly, but extensively across multiple stops and bends until they become essential and visible. So, so I found this, uh, you know, uh, this frame of analysis to be very, very powerful. And then I tried to kind of deploy this framework, but also inform it by, you know, this kind of uh, conceptualization that this East Kolkata wetlands is actually a messy assemblage of constant interactions between the human and the non-human. So again, you see that I divide the non-human into two parts, animate and inanimate. So animate includes polyform bacteria, you know, fungi, algae, water hyacinth, dark, and multiple other, you know, uh, so-called animate entities uh, that make way, you know, to this uh, ecosystem resource. On the other hand, you cannot ignore the functioning of the inanimate world, which is also inextricably interlinked with this, uh, you know, uh, non-human animate and human world. <laughs> infrastructures in terms of log gates, sluices, pumps that actually regulate, you know, the flow of water. So finally, I will take one more minute, Simar. So, uh, uh, you know, I kind of, uh, I'm trained in uh, environmental history being a student of history. So it was easy for me to uh, uh, apply and implement the conventional archival research methodology by looking into uh, the sources and records and gazetteers, you know, and letters uh, that are available in different repositories. And I did ethnography, of course. Uh, so again, the conventional uh, uh, methodology of, uh, or you know, the different methods through which ethnography is pursued, and pretty brilliantly explained the difference between methods and methodologies. But I think I uh, this environmental history, while provided long-term uh, temporal scale, you know, to this analysis, so I could also capture the mediations among actors. I will not say a conflict or collaboration, but I would rather like to emphasize on mediations across actors and shifting mediations through this, you know, long-term temporal trajectory. So apart from, you know, this conventional archival research methodology and ethnography, I also uh, apply, you know, more interdisciplinary methods like oral history, like transit work, and again, within transit work, participatory uh, appraisal methods and also a participatory appraisal for natural uh, resource and illustration analysis, because Anna was talking about, you know, the importance of uh, photographs. So I also started analyzing, you know, the, the, the paintings uh, that I accessed uh, from the libraries of, uh, I mean, he's no more there, but the sanitation expert who, uh, you know, kind of also uh, came up with this term, is Kolkata Wetlands, uh, Professor Dhrubo Ghosh. So 
So this is the final argument that I kind of converged and cross-fertilized these two fields of environmental history and political ecology and formulated my own uh, methodological framework or uh, conceptual uh, tool of analysis called U, which is historical urban political ecology, where, you know, political ecology informs uh, history and uh, vice versa. I think I'll be in a position to shed more light on this uh, so far as the next questions and uh, the discussion round, uh, rounds are concerned. Thank you, Jenya. Um, Karina? Uh, hi, morning, everyone. So my name is Karina. Um, I'm working in a totally different field from uh, what we heard uh, right now, but I'm just going to share uh, what I'm doing right now. So um, I'm working with video games and I'm working on understanding, especially uh, human behavior and emotions. So we are uh, uh, implementing a lot of uh, methods that are qualitative because they give us much, much insightful data into what the uh, players are experiencing when they play a game or when they are completing a task that we ask them to, to complete. So to answer the question of the type of the, the qualitative, qualitative methods that I've used, um, I've used observation, surveys, interviews, uh, focus groups. So we've used a um, variety of uh, different qualitative methods because we believe that uh, playing a game uh, will eat, uh, contains a lot of elements that we want to understand, especially how players uh, experience uh, those aspects or those elements in the game. And we try to understand the emotions that they are experiencing while playing the game. So uh, I think that we have mainly used in my research specifically, so, uh, we implemented interviews and observation. Um, and this uh, gave us uh, the opportunity to gather insightful data and uh, to answer specific research questions that we have. In my um, current research or my, my um, current uh, focus for my research is about interactive narratives. So interactive narratives in, the ter in, in terms of uh, when players decide how the story is going to unfold or decide the outcomes of the story based on their decisions. So we want to understand how they make these decisions, how meaningful these decisions are for the players and how we can improve um, the feeling that the decisions actually have an impact over the story and that uh, uh, it doesn't, uh, like, like it matters what they decide and it's not just a linear story. So um, the type of information that we gather through these met methods is uh, about participants' opinions, emotions, and their experience and uh, their experience while playing this game, especially these interactive narratives and especially when they're making decisions. And we believe this type of uh, data that we collect is crucial to, to, to us to understand this, uh, these uh, behaviors and these emotions that uh, players uh, experience. And this uh, will allow us to improve uh, game design and also usability uh, of the game. So yeah, we think, uh, we believe that uh, qualitative data give us a much richer uh, information about uh, what we are trying to achieve with our research questions. Um, in my last study, we actually uh, conducted a mixed methods approach. So we collected both qualitative and quantitative data. Um, but uh, we analyzed the qualitative data through a thematic analysis approach and we found that this will give us more information about the emotions that participants were experiencing while playing this specific game. Um, and we also uh, conducted some um, uh, facial recognition. Uh, we, we ran a facial recognition software to understand also what kind of emotions they were um, experiencing. So this software gave us the opportunity to collect all the facial uh, facial data and then gave us uh, information about if they were experiencing some, uh, if they were experiencing the specific emotions like being scared or being frustrated or being happy. So I think that uh, that gave us a lot, a lot of uh, insightful information in um, what we were trying to answer. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically this is what we are um, doing right now. And um, we do try to mix both qual quantitative and qualitative, but I found that qualitative give us a more um, in-depth perspective of uh, what players are um, experiencing. So yeah, and 
it's um i'm just gonna stop here because i don't know how uh, if i have enough time but if you have any questions any additional questions about what we're doing in my lab uh, feel free to to reach out thank you karina that was just past three minutes thank you <laughs> um okay so we'll move to round two quickly um the question for or the guiding question for round two is in what other areas have this method been used and for what purpose um, again, we can start with Anita, um, and I'll, I'll start uh, giving a heads up for 2.5 minute mark. Um, Anita, if you can answer that question. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, so I was speaking about scenarios, um, and scenarios, I mean, forever people have used some sort of implicit processes of anticipating the future, assumptions about the future, like it might look similar to the past and whatnot. Um, and scenarios have been used in quantitative models for a long time. Um, but some folks trace the use of these qualitative narrative scenarios back actually to um, the corporate sector with Shell in the 70s, um, where they developed scenarios that helped them, for better or worse, respond to uh, the oil crash and several disruptions thereafter. Um, but now qualitative scenarios are used across public and private sectors in government, in research, and in strategic planning. Um, and in, particularly in, the, in social ecological systems. So there's a really cool database um, called Biosphere Futures. Um, I think the link is biospherefutures.net. I can put it in the chat after. Um, where there's a, a collection of, I think there's like over 50 different studies where the use of scenarios um, that link qualitative and often with quantitative research um, have been applied to social ecological systems um, for various purposes in urban sustainability, um, fisheries, water resources management, et cetera. Um, and I think very, uh, very broadly, these scenarios are often used because the future is very complex, deeply uncertain, um, and the kind of scale and speed of change and what some people would call the Anthropocene is kind of transcending our ability to just look at, at historical trends and project into the future. Um, so it helps us make sense of that, but it's also, you know, many people believe transformative change is required to deal with the sustainability issues of our time. So it helps like uproot this status quo thinking. Um, and so some application areas where this has been um, done that you might have seen is in the shared socioeconomic pathways and climate change research. They used the, the intuitive logics model um, to develop these, um, the five SSPs. Um, in water resources management, they've used qualitative scenarios to um, project broader systemic tendencies to then inform a more holistic idea of what water supply and demand might look like that then can be fed into engineering models. Um, interestingly, to Jenya's research on um, blue infrastructures, um, we've done some work um, with Del Terris on green infrastructures and nature-based solutions using scenarios as a tool to bring economists and financiers together with ecologists to see how the these functionalities of green infrastructure um, like flood risk uh, management and whatnot might evolve over the lifetime of very complex ecologies to help them understand risk um, where you know economists and financiers operate in the language of risk um, and so it's kind of a a boundary object almost <laughs> between different disciplines and perspectives. Um, and so when conducting, sorry, am I over time? <laughs> it's just, um, yeah, 10 more seconds. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so yeah, there are lots of application areas and in the context of, you know, qualitative research, um, these can be, these scenarios can be used both for very specific strategic aims um, to test robustness and, and very specific metrics, and also for broad ideas of, of um, social learning and transformation and that kind of thing. So super diverse, um, and I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Anita. Um, Anna? Hi, so I'll share my screen now. I want to share some pictures. Wait. Am I sharing? 
something. Ah, stop we sharing. can see your screen. Okay. Oh, great. Yep, we can see your presentation. So I'll just quickly go to here. So photo voice was used in different contexts. A lot for, a, it started with public health and then it's also used in education to understand how people understand the different subject, their um, ideas of learning, uh, identity, women empowerment or marginalized groups and human nature linkages. So I'll show some pictures on um, how that was used before. So it started with this uh, work that was in China to understand women uh, standards of living and um, of labor in rural areas. And then uh, they are, this was a um, women empowerment tool to show uh, some conditions of work, some how they were working and taking care of family how they were um, living in that area and how that these pictures could actually show um, or find a way to improve their living conditions and the, their labor conditions in this area. And here is a photo um, that um, shows uh, family and feeding, how they were working uh, in rural areas as well as um, trying to coordinate family uh, issues feeding the children and there are some impactful pictures as well. And also a matter of identity and empowerment of uh, smaller groups or uh, minorities. Uh, for example, this is a picture uh, of this woman that is saying, I am sa sacred, I am Cree, and I am proud. So how uh, research that um, aims also to empower this uh, social and uh, personal identity that people may have and how they identify themselves within the groups. Um, and that also relates to uh, decision-making. If you go to conservation field, for example, we can think about the um, First Nations uh, and the Grand River. How can we understand a bit better their, that identity related to the river and the river basins and resources? Um, different types of nature benefits that people may have. Uh, and uh, here are some pictures, for example, this, uh, this is in Costa Rica. And uh, this was the research on ecosystem services, so how people benefit from nature in different ways. Uh, so cattle and um, coffee plantation for source of income, but also livelihoods. Uh, there was also a river and a volcano that uh, shows the um, uh, recreational aspect of nature in respect to people. And um, if I have time, I'll just show a few more pictures. Yep, 15 more seconds. Okay, so quickly, this is um, a picture of a fisherman that uh, was uh, mentioning how, um, how for him is good to go out fishing. And when he sees the sun rising like this, this uh, landscape actually, uh, takes him out of his problems. And this is the mental hygiene quote that I was mentioning before. And just a few more pictures, the knowledge exchange uh, between a fisherman and uh, local people. This related to food, this is dried fish uh, and um, how this has a specific flavor and this part of their diet and also social interactions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jenya? Yes. So, yeah. yeah. So again, uh, you know, this is the specific field of uh, political ecology and historical political ecology. And historical political ecology is actually uh, not new, because uh, you know this uh, particular approach of looking back to look forward. I think uh, you know we can trace historical roots in political ecology literature and vice versa. So for example, the, this particular book called the Routledge Handbook of Political Ecology with several chapters in it. I think, you know, there are uh, works by Lofters, for example, and by Davies who talk about, you know, this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, how uh, scholars, um, they really, uh, they combined, you know, these two uh, frames of analysis 
to uh, explain uh, the different intricacies in terms of uh, political economic structures. So for example, uh, Michael Watts uh, in his analysis about uh, famine in Nigeria and the kind of impact it was having on the peasant, I, peasants, I think he kind of uh, discussed, he, he, he contextualized it within the larger context of the machinations of you know, capitalism. So similarly, uh, if recently, uh, urban uh, environmental historians, they are also, they, they seem to develop a very strong you know, urban political ecological bent of mind. But it's still emerging, and uh, in South Asia, there are very few works on this, but I think this is a very potential and a rich area. Uh, uh, and, and one good thing is that, you know, we are engaged in uh, this kind of research where we are actually uh, converging uh, history with political ecology. So, for example, we have one uh, particular project, uh, which is this EQIP project. Uh, on uh, what we call fluid governance. So uh, territories which are neither land nor uh, water uh, and, you know, which are fluid actually. So uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, and, and very interestingly, we are discussing uh, two uh, otherwise um, incomparable cases. So this is unexpected comparison between the Rhone Basin uh, from the global no north and uh, the uh, Gonga Basin from the global south. And if you see the scale and complexities, you know, they are so very different. They're very, very divergent. But, you know, again, I think historical political ecology is providing us with, uh, with, with a grand framework through which we are also being able to come up with uh, with, with comparative tactics beyond, uh, you know, beyond conventional, uh, uh, you know, uh, typologies for that matter. So I think, again, uh, I would be happy to discuss this uh, more because, like, uh, recently we also could uh, develop, you know, um, uh, you know, a kind of a, an article comparing two cities, all uh, from the southern part of France and Kolkata. And uh, so we, I'll discuss that maybe later. But what is very important here is that I think historical political ecology, it enables us to trace, you know, larger political and uh, economic processes, institutional structures for uh, that matter. And also it enables us to understand that phenomena like, I think Adit also mentioned that phenomena like floods and phenomena like droughts, these are actually, these are, these are not technical, they are beyond technical and they, they are beyond, you know, physical and material phenomena. So they are mediated. They are constructed socially. So there is a whole story of the social construction of floods. And very quickly, I think I would like to mention about one particular dissertation, which I found fascinating. Uh, so this is a dissertation from West Virginia University, which, uh, so this dissertation was completed in 2007. And the geographers, uh, sorry, one geographer um, and his uh, supervisor, I think, they, uh, they applied participatory GIS. So now I think like we are talking about participatory GIS, but you know, in 2007, I think this was a very unique work where the integrated political ecology and participatory GIS and mixed quantitative and qualitative you know, methods. So they did a very traditional uh, GIS mapping uh, uh, by taking data from the households. And also they, uh, they did scenario analysis. So kind of they traced uh, the history and also saw you know, why there were differences in coping responses or coping mechanisms because you know floods definitely uh, were mediated uh, across locally contingent historical and cultural processes. So we are finding you know this uh, framework uh, of historical particular ecology quite uh, significant for our sorry Jane, please wrap up. Yeah all right so yes uh, that's it and uh, my scholars they are actually applying you know this in their works so uh, yeah so maybe during the discussion session I'll be in a position to discuss this uh, more elaborately. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Um, Karina? Okay, so I'm just gonna try to keep this uh, brief. So um, other areas that uh, the methods that we applied for uh, my research have been used. Well, um, I um, started as a UX researcher, like a user researcher, but uh, mainly I was working with websites and applications. So we were trying, in my case, while I was working with that, I was trying to um, uh, understand usability and user experience from a perspective of uh, uh, asking uh, participants to complete a series of tasks. But uh, these were made in, in static websites or static applications. Um, and then uh, we would, um, uh, measure or assess the usability and the user experience based on the different uh, 
uh, parameters and um, aspects that we were trying to understand. So I started um, working with websites and applications, and then I moved uh, into games. Um, most of the methods that I previously uh, learned for websites um, can be applied um, to a degree uh, when we are trying to understand um, a video game. Um, so the main difference between uh, my previous work uh, and the work that I'm doing right now is basically that uh, the content in a video game is uh, dynamic content. So it's a little bit more difficult to, um, to measure and to understand in terms of specific uh, task or specific elements that we want to understand, but at the same time, it gives you it, it gives us the opportunity to try to come up with um, with different methods or with um, novel methods that we can implement to understand uh, this dynamic content in video games. Um, so I think that uh, the methods or the um, uh, tools that I've used in the past can also be applied to product design, marketing research, and different or other areas. Um, and I think the purpose uh, for these methods can be similar. It's gathering insightful data about participants' opinions, experience, and emotions. Um, and uh, I think uh, what we done in the lab with, um, with our current research the approach um, that we are using is similar to what we what I've done in the past, and uh, we are just adjusting these methods depending on our research questions and the objective of, of uh, our research. And also, what I found is that um, in my lab, uh, because it's a multidisciplinary lab, uh, most of these methodologies can be applied to different areas. So I've, uh, we are seeing right now that these um, methods are uh, being uh, used for, uh, to understand virtual reality, to understand augmented reality and haptics. So I think um, it is interesting how uh, previous uh, methods that we use in different areas can be adjusted and can be implemented uh, in these uh, novel fields. Thank you. I was right at three minutes. <laughs> Okay, we'll move on to the last round. Uh, the guiding question for Rich is, um, in what other areas have this method uh, been used and for what purpose? Um, we'll take the, we'll, we'll go in the same order. Um, Anita, if you would like to address that. Um, is, it, is it possible that I switched around the questions? I think, I think the last one was about resources and access requirements, or am I just? Okay, good. Cool, I'll answer that question. Oh, sorry, um, the, the, yeah, the, the last round, the question is what resources and access requirements do you need? Okay, amazing. Sorry about that. Um, no worries, no worries at all. Um, yeah, so I've spoken, uh, I spoke very broadly about scenarios, but obviously there are tons of very specific methods that can be used to, to develop these scenarios. And so um, in terms of resources and access requirements, there are a lot of kind of broad, uh, reviews of scenario types and techniques that I can share links to um, maybe over email or something um, afterwards um, that come from the field, these emerging interdisciplinary fields of futures studies and anticipatory governance. And so if you're looking for methods, the field of future studies is great for kind of this massive long list of qualitative methods for developing scenarios, um, but they're not very um, clear as to how different choices that you make in your scenario method may impact the scenario outcomes and the kind of uh, implications of doing so, the broad, broader context. And so um, any literature you find on anticipatory governance will, will kind of help you connect different framings and scenario methods to the political implications and, and more of the implications in the social context. Um, in terms of resources and access requirements, um, I, if I'm, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I think uh, if you are doing research on scenarios, especially qualitative scenarios, some sort of collaborative, deliberative workshop space is, is maybe the best kind of option for having um, more holistic outcomes and, and more rep representative of, of all of the things that have been discussed that are um, beneficial and unique to qualitative methods. Um, but like with COVID and other constraints, funding, whatever, um, you can you can 
um, develop qualitative scenarios through other means. So I'm using kind of a quasi qualitative scenario approach for part of my research called cross impact balances. And given COVID, what I'm trying to do is use a bunch of different methods of that I can do virtually, like um, semi structured interviews, guided questionnaires to kind of iterate my way through developing these scenarios with a bunch of people. And then hopefully, down the road, we can use those scenarios to discuss implications in the context and whatnot, and to also validate the modeling that we do. Um, so I hope that um, responds to the question. I'm happy to talk about this more later. And I can share, as I said, I can share um, some links and resources if that's helpful. No, that sounds good. Um, again, I'll repeat the question. Um, there was some question, confusion about the question. Um, for the last round, uh, the question is what resources and access requirements do you need to pursue this methods and where to find them? Um, thanks, Anita, for addressing that, even though I said the wrong question. Um, Anna, if you want to take over. Yes, thank you. Yep. So for photo voice, uh, I think, first of all, maybe the most qualitative research, we need ethics approval from the university and also consent, ask the consent from participants. So consent from people that are participating and give you the photos as well as consent if there are any person in the picture, consent of to use their image. This is also very important for photo voice else. Also, if you want to publish uh, some of your work related to photo voice, you have to make sure that you have all this consent and that people feel comfortable with that. Um, and consent can be given different ways, can be written consent or ver verbal consent. This is depending on the context of your research. Um, and also you need a camera, so you, you can provide your own camera and give to participants, they, they, they can go there and take the pictures, or they can use their own cameras, and in my case that was kind of um, easy because people were using their own phones. Um, sometimes the camera of the phone is good, sometimes not as good, so depending on also the purpose of uh, the photos, what are you doing with that afterwards, is uh, relevant to think about the, the quality of the camera. But overall, uh, I had no, no issues with that. People were taking their photos, they were sending me to, through WhatsApp, some of them were printed. Um, I think that's also something that is relevant. So I printed the pictures and we were discussing and they were telling me what the pictures represent in a printed format. So that was good for engagement. Um, but you can also do that in your phone or computer or, um, yeah. So I think I'm most, uh, also this is time consuming. So you have to have some time in the field to do uh, that or try to identify ways that you can connect with uh, people in a long uh, time and remember them constantly to take the picture to what is your probe question. Um, so I think camera, consent, ethics, and time are the resources uh, requirements. Thank, thank you. Um, Jenya? Jenya, please go ahead. I think you're muted. Jenya, yes, uh, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> so, uh, so this is the question, and but my answer uh, can be misleading and confusing. But uh, as the question, you can already see on the right hand side. So there is no doubt that you know uh, that uh, it's a mistake from Seymour's side. But I would be deliberately, you know, diverging, so and uh, deviating. Because, uh, like for example, uh, to me, the resources and access uh, requirements, uh, uh, you know, it's not. I mean, of course, uh, as Anna and Anita mentioned, that what are the more technical things which we actually need to pursue this kind of uh, research or qualitative research. But apart from that, because that that we all of us know. But apart from that, I think we have to be very bold. We have to be radical, desperate. Uh, you know, have, we have to have a lot of courage and also we have to have an openness to embrace, you know, plural epistemologies. So, uh, so for example, uh, so I have framed it like this, uh, that we need to have real motivation and openness to embrace the plural apart from and along with the political. And so we ha really have to have an inner conviction to non-hyphenated categories, for example, categories like social nature 
or hydrocession. Unfortunately, non-hyphenated itself is hyphenated. So we have to think about it uh, later a bit more. But yes, I think if you need to do your transdisciplinary research, you really have to have a whole lot of motivation and openness to embrace plural. Uh, triangulation, so I think Anika, Anna, and uh, uh, so um, I, all of us, we have uh, talked about storylines, why and how is, it is so important to actually capture storylines. And by storylines, we mean, you know, all kinds of stories, and also maybe a single story from multiple perspectives and multiple angles. So obliterated stories, repressed stories, suppressed stories, mainstream stories, conventional stories, animated stories, all kinds of stories, right? And so we have to engage ourselves with textured, multi-layered analysis, shaped by situatedness. Right. So, uh, and place making is such an important thing uh, these days. We really have to concentrate on varied geographies. And this is the final uh, um, thing which I think uh, is important. The last T uh, that you know, finally some sort of transsectoral translation is required because you know, even you know, the research like V2V or DFM or Equip for that matter. You know, if we say that you know, we would we want to uh, restrict ourselves within the theoretical domain then it really does not make sense. And those days where academicians say, used to say that you know, academicians are only meant to provide perspective for actions and civil society would really you know, uh, transcend uh, these theories into actions. I think this boundary between academician and civil society has also you know, uh, has been blurred, if not dismantled. So I think we really have to engage ourselves from this knowing to the doing mode. And we really have to, I, I mean, I, I cannot say we, but I think personally I'm fascinated with uh, this understanding of translating uh, or with this, I have this motivation. I don't know, like I am also aware of the limits, but how we can really turn, transcend political ecology uh, into uh, or as an engaged praxis. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Karina? Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, answering that question of resources and uh, access mm -hmm. requirements. Yeah. Um, so uh, similar to what Anna mentioned, we for most of the studies that we conduct, we need um, um, ethics. Um, we need a consent from the uh, participant. Uh, could be video recording, audio recording, or uh, if we're gonna be using a um, uh, specialized software that uh, then we must uh, we must make sure that uh, that we have the consent from participants. So I have uh, some experience also with uh, biometrics uh, data collection. So in that case, when we're using sensors or other devices that uh, the participant is wearing while um, completing the task. It is important to have consent, and um, because we don't know if this is going to affect them in some way, so we need to be very clear from the beginning how we're going to be using these devices, and also how we're going to be collecting the data. And in terms of tools that we use uh, for uh, when we collect the data, we'll, uh, we use interviews and uh, we use observation. So yeah, we 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 need some um, cameras to record the the session and some sort of uh, device to um, record uh, the, the audio from the session as well. And then we use uh, specific software, so for example, to uh, do transcripts of the interviews, we use Otter. And uh, when we're using, um, when we are implementing uh, thematic analysis for the data that we collected, the ones we uh, transcribe the interviews, we use this software called, uh, called uh, Dovetail to start creating all the themes for the data that we collected. And um, basically it, uh, it's, it depends on the type of uh, study that we are um, running. So for example, if we're doing something with a virtual reality, then we need the headsets. If we're doing something with augmented reality, we need the devices as well. So it, um, it really depends on the type of study we're running, but uh, overall in like general terms, these are the, the tools and the resources that we mostly use. Um, access for these uh, tools, well, I think it depends. Um, most of them you have to pay for, but then uh, you, have, um, you have some free trials for these resources. And because they're so specialized, that's why I think uh, uh, you need a specific, uh, special access for these uh, resources. But um, if you're interested in knowing more about uh, any specific tool that we're using, uh, feel free to reach out and we can discuss that in more detail later. 
Sounds good. Thank you, Karina. Um, so that's the end of round three, and that ends the panel discussion. Um, <clears throat> we do have um, activities and hands-on training aspect to this webinar. So um, I believe Karina and Anita have something planned. If you would like to give a quick summary, we can do, <clears throat> sorry, we can do two breakout rooms, um, one led by Karina and another led by Anita. Um, each participant will get an option of attending either one of those. Both sessions will be recorded and made available at a later date. So you're not missing out on one if you choose to attend one of them right now. Um, so I would like Karina and Anita to give a quick overview of um, what the activity is and what it's, it pertains to. So participants can decide what they wanna participate in. Um, again, you'll have 20 to 25 minutes to run the activity and then we'll end the session we'll, with the question answer um, section. Um, I will open the floor to Anita to give a quick summary and quick understanding of the activity. Sure, so uh, in my group, uh, what we'll do is uh, collaboratively develop a set of four scenarios very quickly um, based on a little case study that we make up together um, uh, using the intuitive logics method um, where we define a couple of critical uncertainties and end states um, and depending on how much time we have um, start discussing the implications of these combinations of uncertainties um, for the case study that we're talking about. So it will be kind of a crash course um, in this uh, one scenario method um, and hopefully we'll have time to talk more casually about um, experiences and questions and that kind of thing. Sounds good. Um, Karina? Yeah, uh, the activity that I have planned is um, uh, we're going to work um, with automatic analysis. So we have some reviews for a, a video game. And uh, what we're going to be doing is um, uh, reading those reviews and understanding if there are any um, method, uh, if, sorry, any themes that um, are relevant to the reviews. So yeah, we're gonna be working uh, with a thematic analysis approach. We're gonna be uh, coding that data, and then we're gonna be deciding on the, and defining the different themes for these reviews. Uh, I'm not sure if we're gonna have enough time to complete the task, because it's a little bit uh, long, but uh, yeah, time dependent. We, if you have any uh, questions at uh, the end of, uh, of the activity, feel free to to let me know and then um, we can discuss in more detail. Okay, thanks. Um, I've opened two rooms, one um, for scenario building with Anita and another for thematic analysis with Karina. Um, I believe you um, all participants would have received a notification. So if you can uh, select a room you would like to go to, um, you can do that now. For it. Oh, we're still getting some more people. Okay, this is a big breakout room. Here we go, okay. It might be a bit tricky to facilitate back and forth because we are quite a large group. So if you feel like you aren't able to like jump in, please like, I think I should be able to see if you raise your hand or just indicate in the chat and I'll try my best to allow everyone to, to contribute. Also, um, I'm here to help facilitate. I'll let you know if there's questions. Samara just asked me if I could, so oh, I'm here to help. Yeah, here. Thank I'll you turn on much. my video so you have a face, but yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll help facilitate with questions. I'll let you know. Amazing. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, great. So I, as I mentioned, um, I thought it would be neat to work together um, to develop a very brief, quick set of scenarios just so you can see this intuitive logics method in action. Um, and hopefully we'll also have time for a bit more of a Q&A conversation about it. Um, um, so maybe what I'll do is ask if people are comfortable, like no pressure either way to turn on cameras, um, it's nice to like see faces who I'm speaking to, but if your internet connection isn't going to allow that or you don't feel like it, that's also fine. Um, great, and so what we'll be doing today is um, I chose a case study that I actually don't know that much about because I work on freshwater river basins mostly, but I figured there'd be a, people, a lot of people interested in coastal marine fisheries here. So. Um, I thought we could pretend that we are 
quite a large research team uh, doing research on coastal fisheries, um, maybe in Canada, we'll just choose that. Um, and we want to work with some stakeholders, perhaps we are the stakeholders, um, to use scenarios to kind of evaluate the effectiveness of the policies that we're considering now in the long term. And we've decided um, that the intuitive logics approach is the approach that we want to use. So just to repeat, um, we're a group of researchers slash stakeholders in a Canadian coastal fishery. Um, and we're developing scenarios to evaluate, you know, what the research and policy recommendations that we're considering now, their effectiveness in the longer term future. And so um, how this will go, I'll give you a brief overview and then walk you through each of the steps, um, is that we'll work together to identify at least five, maybe we'll come up with 10, we'll see drivers of change in these systems. Um, so very broadly, drivers of change. Um, we'll then try to choose two of these drivers of change that are both high in importance and high in uncertainty. So those are the two criteria um, and we'll try to agree. We might not agree, that's fine. We'll just, if we don't agree, we'll pick some and move on. Um, we will then have those two, what we call critical uncertainties. And then we will develop end states for each of those uncertainties. So often these end states are like high and low or like the positive and negative version of those drivers of change. So if you're saying like, biodiversity you could be like very high and very low or something like that so i'm being vague but i hope you understand um and then what we'll do is put those two uncertainties on an axis so say our horizontal axis is one uncertainty our vertical axis is another we'll have four scenarios in each quadrant and we'll start talking about implications and we'll see how long this takes us um and so i'll share my screen and i have like a I should have done this on like a Miro board or something, but it's on PowerPoint, um, just to keep track of our discussion so you can all see what we're coming up with. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. So are there any questions? I will walk you through this. So I'm not like leaving you to uh, <laughs> any questions at the moment. No questions. Okay. okay, awesome. Cool, so let me just share my screen. Where is PowerPoint? Here we go. Okay, you can all see my screen. Yeah? I see nods. Okay, cool. I'm just going to add a slide in here. Um, so first thing, um, feel free to put these in the chat or to unmute yourself um, and throw them out there popcorn style. Emily, I don't know if you want to like facilitate since we have quite a few people. Um, just brainstorming some potential drivers of change um, in a coastal fishery in Canada. I know it's vague, but I'm sure we will have some ideas. I'll keep an eye on the chat and I'll let you know. <laughs> okay, amazing. Don't be shy. There's no right or wrong answer here. <laughs> All right, we have population change as a driver. Pollution. Also increasing tourism, definitely. I'll just put tourism for now. Hmm. Climate change. Yeah, we have that twice for sure. Amazing, yeah, definitely. Any like global trends or broad sweeping global changes that might impact coastal fisheries? Rising sea levels and or temperature, I would say. I'm just gonna throw it in there. <laughs> we have also agriculture slash nutrient loading. Microplastics too. Mm. Combo, lots of stuff, yeah. Okay, well, that's already a lot. Perfect. <laughs> um, so I'm going to just stop there. Thank you so much for everyone. Um, yeah, that was quick. Um, okay, so we have population change. Um, so I'm just going to say population. Um, pollution, uh, I might loop that in with um, including, actually, no, maybe not. Never mind. I take that back. Um, kind of the 
how agriculture is um, <laughs> in nutrient loading, um, level of tourism, climate change, which I might kind of put this in brackets as an elaboration of that, um, and microplastics, which could also probably be related to pollution, but not necessarily. Um, and so what would be great, I actually don't know how you set up a voting thing in um, Zoom, so we won't do that. Um, but perhaps if you could put in the chat, um, which two of these you think are both very high in uncertainty and very important for a Canadian coastal fishery. We have climate change. I also was going to say, yeah, climate change is popping up a couple times as one. Okay. Climate change is a good one for these exercises mm -hmm. because it's very broad, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. another person said climate change. Yeah, it seems like that's... And pollution. So someone said pollution as another one. I was honestly thinking that too. I was thinking climate change and pollution. Yeah, and pollution does include microplastics, nutrient loading, or it can, right? So yeah, and they maybe... include chemical. Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Well, why don't we move ahead unless there are... Um, Okay, more air pollution and microplastics. Yeah. All right, why don't we move ahead with two axes, one of them being climate change and one of them being pollution, and we'll include in that pollution category um, whatever kind of pollution we feel is necessary. Um, so uh, we have climate change as Oh, you're watching me type and make mistakes, um, pollution. And so to develop axes, sorry if you can hear my dog barking in the background, <laughs> um, to develop axes um, for each of these critical uncertainties, we need to choose two mutually exclusive end states. So these don't necessarily have to be like extreme and not extreme or like high and low. They can be more detailed, but they just have to be mutually exclusive, meaning there's like a very distinct difference between the two of them. Um, so for climate change, maybe we can just keep using the chat since that's effective, though I would love to hear people's voices if they feel uh, they want to share. Um, no, right, no wrong answers here. There's a bunch of ways you can define different end states for these uncertainties. Can you please define what you mean by an end state? End state sure. in terms of fisheries? Sure, no, end state in terms of how this uncertainty, say, okay, that's a great question and is probably important. So say we're making these scenarios to the year 2050. Um, looking at the uncertainty of climate change in isolation, isolation from everything else, um, the state of climate change in the year 2050, what that might look like. So that could be defined by um, more extreme climate scenarios like, uh, you could just say uh, extreme sea level rise, um, for example, could be an end state um, where the opposite end state might be um, low sea level rise or something like that. Um, does that help? So we're thinking about, yeah. Yeah, that was good, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we go with the um, extreme sea level rise? And um, more free, greater frequency of, of extreme weather events. Does that? Someone also just mentioned, what about unmanageable CO2 levels? Or also someone said extinction of certain species. Oh, another mm -hmm. person also said extinction of species. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, climate change is so broad that it could include all of those things. Right, um, yeah. So what if we just said that climate change, um, we do a terrible job of mitigating greenhouse, global greenhouse gas emissions and, you know, all of the impacts that we're talking about apply. And then a more, a less extreme where, where greenhouse gas emissions are reduced um, and less, less impact.
Okay, just to move on, I think we'll be able to develop scenarios from that. Um, so from the pollution end of things, um, obviously this is another broad category. Um, however, this can be related, you know, if we're thinking about end states of pollution in 2050, it can be both related to the actual pollutants that are, are there, and it can also be related to like broader policies related to pollution um, and kind of the ethos behind those policies and stuff like that. So um, any suggestions for end states for the pollution uncertainty? The suggestion loss of marine biodiversity and extinction was for the climate change one, right? In the chat? That's what I was thinking, yeah, because that was typed before. Okay. But could that be for pollution? Probably, yeah. Right. Uh, then we have reduction in the level of, of pollutant versus no reduction. Yeah, so you're, it's kind of like a status quo versus... Um, Mm -hmm. more uh, sustainable kind of approach. It can affect the biological oxygen demand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe like, because you're saying policies, maybe like if there was a total ban on some kind of certain pollutant or something. Yeah. Versus nothing. Kind of like yeah. Um. So we could do kind of uh, to what... Um, Mm -hmm. Someone said plastic Someone's... pollution of every type leading to death of biodiversity. So yeah, so link to yeah. Yeah, so so a lot of these are kind of linked. So what if and and I think the challenging part about defining these end states is deciding what is an end state and what is an implication of that end state, right? Um, and so a lot a lot of these kind of get into the implications where we're saying okay. Um, if there's a lot of pollution, then there will be a lot of implications related to biodiversity and BOD and, you know, all of these things. So what if we take one of these kind of more general suggestions like above where we say, um, like, uh, reduction in pol pollution through strict regulation or something like that, or bans, and then, um, the opposite of that, <laughs> which would be um, <laughs> uh, increase in, uh, in pollution, um, lack of regulation, etc. Does that sort of make sense? Okay, we have five more minutes remaining. Okay, let's assume this is okay, just so you can see how this gets uh, set up on an axis. So here we have um, like a typical just qua four quadrants. Um, we have, say we have uh, U1 is climate change. And we say um, we mitigate successfully. So we are not dealing with many impacts. Um, U2, U1 negative would be climate change. Um, we do not meet the Paris Accord agreements across the board. Um, Sorry, these labels are a little all over the place. Um, then we have uh, pollution, um, uncontrolled high levels. Um, and we have pollution and then um, strict regulations, low levels. So here now what we have is um, two axes, each with a critical uncertainty, each with mutually exclusive end states for each uncertainty. And what we would then do um, in three minutes <laughs> is to um, discuss often with, once you, um, if this is done in a workshop setting, you, you've got these set up, your stakeholders have kind of uh, agreed upon what are the most critical end states. And then you develop narratives for what the future of that specific context might look like if you have successful climate mitigation and you have um, strict regulations with low levels of pollution, what would those implications of that future be on the coastal fishery, on the policies that you're talking about? You can use that future as a way to kind of test the assumptions behind your research and the policies and whatnot that you're talking about. 
Um, in the same way that, say, you ha we have successfully mitigated climate change, but we have uncontrolled and high levels of pollution. Um, these are all plausible, you know, these things could happen, but we often talk about like ideal utopias and then like dystopias where everything goes wrong, but it's often a mix of those, right? So th these kind of scenarios where you have a positive change in one uncertainty and a negative change in the other can be really interesting. And we don't really have time to get into it. Um, but obviously one of the limitations of this is that it can only handle two drivers of change. Um, and usually there's like a bunch of drivers of change that are all interacting. Um, and I'm not using this method in my research. I'm using a method called cross impact balances, which is essentially like you take this and you expand it to a matrix of like 10 or 15 uncertainties, each with different end states. And you try to explore interactions between all of them and then run them in a model to then see what kind of internally consistent or plausible scenarios emerge. I know that's a very, <laughs> vague and crash course across impact balances, but this, these are super useful tools. So anyway, I've been talking a lot. Um, thank you so much for your input into our um, very quick uh, set of four scenarios here. Um, it's too bad we don't get to talk about implications enough, but um, I'd love to take any questions or comments um, from this very quick summary. Um, Anita, just one question. Um, what was the name of the method that you're using? Is cross impact analysis? Yeah, so this is intuitive logic. This one that we just did, and then cross impact balances cross -impact is balance. the other. Okay. And it's, um, uh, yeah, there's some really interesting papers that look at mm -hmm. comparing these two because intuitive logics is, is more accessible for stakeholders. You can do it a bit more quickly. Um, Whereas cross impact balances, it's pretty complex yeah. you know, to run it in a software coded in R or use Scenario Wizard or another modeling software. But um, I can also share some resources um, afterwards if you like. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I I can contact you, contact you later and share. sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Myro board link and it has a password and I also shared the password. Uh, let me know when you're there and I can start explaining a little bit. I mean, I think uh, first of all, um, I would like to hear from the participants if you have uh, any a previous experience with uh, thematic analysis or if this is the first time that you work uh, with this uh, method. My first time. <laughs> Okay. First time as well. <laughs> How about Siet and Vanessa? No? Okay. Um, Vanessa. Vanessa says it's first. Okay. So I'm going to explain a little bit about the web thematic analysis. So if you are already in um, the Myra board, I think I'm gonna share my screen just so you have a better understanding of, let me just give a second. There we go. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So I'm gonna give you a, a quick introduction to what the, um, Uh, thematic analysis. Is. So um, I just uh, got this information. I got the link here from where I got this information. But basically, uh, if you want to uh, look for the original authors for this uh, approach, I will share some papers with you as well. Um, so what are we going to be doing with, uh, with the qualitative data that we have right now, which is um, some uh, game reviews that we got some 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 random people that uh, they have their own an, an, an specific opinion about that game. Uh, so we have uh, six reviews uh, from a website called metacritic.com, which is uh, just a website that, that uh, okay, it's, a, it's a database for uh, reviews on games, um, movies and different um, 
different data. So the, the thematic analysis normally has a six step uh, process. So in this process, what we have is uh, you familiarize with the data first. So you are gonna be reading the reviews. Then you're gonna start uh, coding this data. What, uh, what do I mean by coding? So we have an example here. And uh, basically what, what, you, what you do is while you're reading this review or while you're reading this interview extract or the qualitative data that you have, you start coding and you start having like these keywords that uh, you find in this, um, in this transcript. So you start uh, developing these keywords and then um, you start generating the themes. So uh, this activity should be done in, in, in um, not individually, but by groups, because we all have to agree in the themes that we are generating, in the keywords that we, that we are generating. So after we generate the themes, and the themes are gonna look something like this, once you have the codes, you analyze the codes and then you have uh, the initial themes. Normally the themes should be more descriptive. So for example, uncertainty to a specific thing, distrust of uh, experts, and then we uh, define what expert, expert means. So we have, uh, once we have the initial themes, then, the, then we review the themes and we develop these themes and we may them, make them more descriptive. Um, and finally, when we, once we agree on um, this uh, definition for the themes and naming the themes, we write up our um, analysis of what we found in this uh, qualitative data. So we named the theme and we said, uh, in this qu uh, qualitative data, we found that uh, participants talked about this because they felt like this. So uh, we are gonna be talking more specifically about what we found in the data. Okay. So this is the example, if you, you wanna look at it to uh, be more familiar with what we're gonna be doing. And then we have the reviews. So here we have six reviews uh, from uh, different, um, different people, random people, and they are reviewing the game Cyberpunk. Uh, so what you're gonna be doing is uh, you're gonna be reading these reviews then you're gonna be uh, developing first the codes, and then after that we can discuss. Uh, have you used Meyer before? So here you have uh, different options. So for example, you can add a sticky note and said um, the code that I found is I don't know code one or let's say good um, graphics. So that's the first code, for example. Uh, so you can use that, uh, that the feature of the sticky notes to start developing your, um, your codes. And I'm gonna give uh, around 10 minutes to start developing the codes and then we can discuss. Okay, do you have any questions? Not now, maybe during the process. <laughs> Perfect. All right, I'll be here.
Karina, can you please explain the sticky notes again? <laughs> Sorry. Sure, no problem. So yeah, once you create a sticky note, mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, two um, kind of like uh, cursors here. So if you okay. click on the, when it's the arrow, you can move it. Okay. And if you double click it, you can uh, edit the okay. text. Yep. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna give, uh, I mean, I'll, I don't think we're gonna have uh, enough time to go through all the reviews. So um, I'm just gonna give a couple more minutes to develop uh, some additional uh, codes and then we can discuss.
Okay, just got a message that we should wrap up at 9.45. Uh, so, okay, let's just uh, discuss uh, some of the codes that you found. So I'm, I'm uh, seeing like, for example, good story, but uh, it needs some improvements. And uh, normally when we start um, coding uh, data for uh, the first uh, round, we um, just uh, create codes that are uh, easy to understand. So maybe uh, short codes that allow us to understand um, what are we looking at the data. And uh, yeah, I forgot to mention, but I really like that um, you are uh, highlighting the portions of the reviews where you're getting the codes from. So, okay, some of the codes frustrated, uh, captivating, uh, for example, extra work to do, good story, but issues. So uh, if any one of you can um, uh, tell me what uh, their initial impression of this data or what they understand uh, from uh, what they're, uh, they've been reading and coding, can you tell me, um, give me an idea of what the, what the, the people think about the game? So uh, yeah, I'm not sure if have any volunteers or... Okay. They liked the game, but there were a lot of glitches. Okay. Anything else? The story is good. So the graphics is uh, okay. And the, um, there are some bugs or some things, some issues that they found. Yeah. Um, so the interesting thing about this is, for example, when you're going to release a product, it's important that you do uh, use a research. And then um, the problem with this game was that uh, there was a lot of uh, expectations from it because the developers gave a lot of expectations from the game. And it was an expensive game. And then when it was released, it was full of glitches, it was full of bugs, and it was, uh, it was not ready for release. So it received a lot of negative uh, reviews, which is why, like I mentioned, it's important to do some res user research before and make sure that uh, what you are um, releasing, uh, it's uh, up to the standards of what the players are expecting, right? So positive things like uh, graphics are good, story is good, but all the negative things that we found like bugs and glitches are gonna impact the experience that we have. So it doesn't matter that we have these positive things if we can't play the game. So that's why it's important to, to um, like, I, like I mentioned, do research. And then when, uh, for example, when uh, doing qualitative analysis like this one, it will give us a better perspective of what the problems are or what the issues are and uh, what we need to address um, when we are, uh, I don't know, developing a, a um, Probably could be a methodology, could be a product, could be different things. But um, I, I think uh, understanding this method, it will give us a really insightful um, perspective into what uh, we need to address to improve uh, the experience. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up uh, here because I know that we have to go back to, to, the, um, to the other Zoom session. Uh, but if you have any questions or if um, you want to learn more about this, uh, reach out, uh, feel free to reach out and I'm more than happy to discuss uh, in more detail uh, this uh, thematic analysis um, approach that we are using for some of, uh, of our studies, okay? Great, thank you. Perfect. No problem. Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope that was enough time to get some activity in. Um, I wanted to leave some time at the end for some discussion and some questions. Um, so I would like to open the floor to all the participants to ask questions to either all panel members or specific ones, please go ahead. You can either unmute yourself or um, leave your question in the chat box and I'll read it out. I have a question to Karina. 
If the Miro uh, website or tool is, uh, do you know if it is used for qualitative research overall, like in different areas to code um, interviews or any type of qualitative data? I mean, it could be used. Like uh, it's more for our um, collaborative board to do different things. So you can um, have different templates. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's more like a board for general stuff, but also, I mean, you can use it for that as well. Um, there are other uh, tools that are also used for uh, thematic analysis. Um, I think that, yeah, uh, for example, Siad mentioned thematic analysis with MVivo. So uh, there are different tools, like uh, maybe I can give you a list of uh, tools that you can use for for specifically for thematic analysis, but also for different uh, types of uh, qualitative uh, analysis. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank all of the panelists for their great roundtable discussion. It was really helpful. So I got a specific question for uh, not for any individual, like whoever wants, you can jump in. So the question is, uh, how important a theory is for qualitative research? Is it mandatory to have a theory for every qualitative research? I can start. <laughs> uh, I think the theory will give you the basis of the research and the directions that you go. And then the qualitative methods that you're using will help you to make sure that you can address the theory and answer your specific questions. So the methods is more a way for you to engage with your question and with the theory. So I would say yes. And then the theory will also depend on your field. And then you can also use the methodology to understand the what type of uh, methods you're using or how that will help you in addressing this interlink between your questions and theory. I don't know if that answered your questions or if anyone else has something to add. No, that's fine for me. <laughs> that answered my question. And I also, uh, I'm also curious to know, uh, like, what is the basic difference between a theoretical uh, framework and analytical framework? We know analytical framework we use for analyzing data, but uh, is it, in some cases, it, it might be different from theory and analytical framework. So uh, do you have any thoughts about this, like the difference between analytical framework and theoretical framework? From my a point of view, I think the uh, theoretical framework is uh, the background theory that we are using to support uh, your research context. And the analytical framework is also this mix between what is the theory or what is the subject that you're uh, researching and how you plan to analyze that and how you're using the theory to understand your data. So um, there is some uh, interconnections between them. One of them is mostly on the what are the background information that is helping you to come up with your assumptions or your hypothesis. And the, the analytical framework is a mix between the theoretical background and how you plan, how you're using that to understand your data. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think Anna did a great job of describing that, I mean, I, and I would agree with everything she said. Um, and I think that, like, if you Google what is the difference between a conceptual, theoretical, and analytical framework, there's no kind of clear agreement um, amongst research communities, um, and it and it differs. I think um, depending on the purpose of your study and whatnot. So it, it is kind of a challenge to differentiate these things. And as Anna said, there's like a lot of overlap between them. Um, so I think. In developing, if you're developing a conceptual and analytical or theoretical and analytical framework, or if you're trying to do a big kind of consolidation of things, like that is kind of this reflexive, like come up with something 
you know, ask people if it makes sense, try to reflect it back against your methodology. I, I don't think, um, in my experience, it's never, okay, I have my theoretical framework and I have my idea about my methods and now I'm gonna make my analytical framework. It's a bit more of a messy approach. Maybe others have a more uh, systematic and uh, structured experience with it, but that's been mine. So my conclusion too, like sometimes it seems like uh, same, like both theoretical framework and analytic framework we use like for same research, but sometimes it might be different. So that was my conclusion was like, uh, what is the actual difference between them? And uh, is it really necessary to have two framework for one research or we can guide research just from one theory or one framework? Yes, uh, maybe um, I can add uh, quickly to this. Uh, so I think, uh, I mean, as Anna also mentioned and Anita mentioned that a whole lot of debate is actually going on, you know, between what is a the what a theory is all about and what are the, what is what are the differences between theories, models, and frameworks. And also, you know, if you uh, work with natural scientists, so if there are like natural scientists, social scientists, uh, and uh, other stakeholders on board, you will see that in the way you know social scientists, for example, understand model or framework is also quite different from the way you know uh, maybe a hydrologist uh, understand uh, a model or a framework. So I think, I mean, uh, this is something which many researchers face, this problem, this constraint, that, you know, how to approach and how to, you know, um, uh, how to how to uh, pursue uh, our own research. So I think, um, I mean, uh, when I was doing my research, so definitely I was also confused and uh, I received a major suggestion and I really followed it and uh, it was quite useful. So what happened is that the uh, mentor, uh, pointed out, he suggested that, you know, you, you, you haven't, you first have an agenda and you design your research questions. So, and, uh, and your research questions, uh, definitely uh, they should emanate from the research objectives or the other way around. So from your research objectives, your research questions would emanate or, you know, your research questions will, will help you to, uh, uh, to kind of consolidate your research objectives. So then start concentrating on your research objectives and also on the research questions and try to see that what could be the methods or maybe amalgamation of methods to which you, know, you will be able to address your uh, research question or maybe two, three questions club together as uh, one major research question for a particular objective. And so once, you know, uh, you uh, design that or once, you know, you know, like these uh, are going to be the methods through which you'll be uh, able to accomplish the research objective in the best manner possible, then automatically, you know, from uh, below, you, you, you gradually will be able to uh, consolidate your grip and grasp on the theoretical foundation, I suppose. But again, there is no like uh, made easy or, you know, uh, sacrosanct or universal standardized uh, answers or responses to this. Yeah, I understand and thank you, Jenya Didi. Are there any other questions? Um, I would like to ask a quick question, um, if all panelists can kind of um, answer. It's, um, can you foresee any issues coming up for folks who have primarily worked with quantitative um, methodologies who are maybe switching into more of a qualitative study? Um, do you have any um, advice on that front or do you have any issues that you see uh, coming up? If uh, you can reflect a little bit on that. So um, if I have understood you correctly, uh, Simar, it's about like uh, whether the uh, researchers who were uh, kind of pursuing quantitative research methodology, whether they are, you know, uh, they, are, they are shifting to uh, the use of qualitative research methodology or not. Is that the question? Or if, if you have any suggestions, because we have a lot of participants who have primarily worked with quantitative um, research methodologies in the past, and this is something, this is more of a new arena for them completely. Um, so I was wondering if you could kind of um, talk about some of the things to watch out or some of the things that um, you would want them to focus on to kind of make that transition easier. 
Yeah, so I think uh, Anna and uh, Anita and Karina, they will be in a better position to talk about the resources. And then I can finally, for a minute, moralize and philosophize it. <laughs> Um, I can jump in. Um, I was trained originally as an engineer and I now do very like qualitative research. So I did made this transition. Um, and I think like, hmm, I'm trying to just <laughs> think through how to say this. I think at, at its very core, I think the first thing that's required in order to, to step into this realm of qualitative research is that um, kind of in the scientific engineering, natural sciences community, there's kind of this, um, there's still this pervasive idea that like the only kind of data that's important or valid or legitimate or salient, you know, like these metrics that we use to like decide what knowledge we think is important and should be used in decision making or in our research. Um, I think we often look at quantitative data, you know, like quantitative models as kind of the pinnacle <laughs> um, and everything else is like supplementary to that. Um, and I think the first thing is to kind of try to break down that assumption entirely um, and try to view all of these different methods as completely complementary in providing an enriched picture of what's going on. Um, and so if you're firmly rooted in the quantitative methods, that is super valuable, um, really important for the kind of work that we do, but it's not everything. And there's things that qualitative methods do that quantitative just cannot. Um, and so trying to kind of, yeah, overcome those assumptions, perhaps you're more enlightened than I was when I first stepped into the qualitative methods realm, but but that would be the first kind of major challenge I'd speak to. Um, I'll let others jump in, um, but yeah, that's where I'll stop. Yeah, we have a minute left, so just any quick thoughts are welcome. Thanks, Nita. Thanks for the response. And I think you, you kind of captured what I was trying to get from the panel. So thank you very much. Um, okay, I would like to end today's session by thanking all panelists for their very insightful um, knowledge on qualitative analysis and for bringing your own experience to the group. Um, we can, I would, if um, all participants wanna, um, start their video, I can take a quick picture and we can also thank the panelists as well. Okay, thank you all, that's time. Um, Please keep post, I'll keep you posted on upcoming events, or you can go to our websites. There is a website for ECGG, SWIGS, and v2vglobalpartnership.org. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter as well for updated um, and upcoming events. Um, thank you all. Have a great rest of your day, and thank you for tuning in from around the world. Thank you. And thank you, thank you. both. Thank Simen you. And have a good day. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. organizing. Thank you, Em. Um... Thank you, take care.